Guinevere Alfred Lord Tennyson Queen Guinevere had fled the court, and sat there in the holy house at Almesbury weeping, none with her save a little maid, a novice, one low light betwixt and burned blurred by the creeping mist, for all abroad, beneath a moon unseen albeit at full, the white mist, like a face cloth to the face, clung to the dead earth, and the land was still. For hither had she fled, her cause of flight so moderate. He that like a subtle beast lay couching with his eyes upon the throne, ready to spring, waiting a chance, for this he chilled the popular praises of the king with silent smiles of slow disparagement. And tampered with the lords of the white horse, he then, the brood by Hungist left, and sought to make disruption in the table round of Arthur, and to splinter it into feud serving his traitorous end. And all his aims were sharpened by strong hate for Lancelot. For thus it chanced one morn when all the court, green suited, but with plumes that mocked the May, had been, there wound, a ming and returned, that moderate still and green, all ear and eye, climbed to the high top of the garden wall to spy some secret scandal if he might, and saw the queen who sat betwixt her best Enid, and Lissam Vivian, of her court the williest and the worst. And more than this he saw not, for Sir Lancelot passing by spit where he couched, and as the gardener's hand picks from the colewort a green caterpillar, so from the high wall in the flowering grove of grasses Lancelot plucked him by the heel, and cast him as a worm upon the way. But when he knew the prince though marred with dust, he, reverencing king's blood in a bad man, made such excuses as he might, and these full nightly without scorn. For in those days no knight of Arthur's noblest dealt in scorn. But, if a man were hauled or hunched, in him by those whom God had made full limb and tall, scorn was allowed as part of his defect, and he was answered softly by the king and all his table. So Sir Lancelot hoped to raise the prince, who rising twice or thrice full sharply smote his knees, and smiled, and went, but, ever after, the small violence done rankled in him and ruffled all his heart, as the sharp wind that ruffles all day long a little bitter pool about a stone on the bare coast. But when Sir Lancelot told this matter to the queen, at first she laughed lightly, to think of Modred's dusty fall, then shuddered, as the village wife who cries I shudder, someone steps across my grave. Then laughed again, but faintlier, for indeed she half foresaw that he, the subtle beast, would track her guilt until he found, and hers would be forevermore a name of scorn. Henceforward rarely could she front in hall, or elsewhere, Modred's narrow foxy face, heart hiding smile, and grey persistent eye, henceforward to, the powers that tend the soul, to help it from the death that cannot die, and save it even in extremes, began to vex and plague her. Many a time for hours, beside the placid breathings of the king, in the dead night, grim faces came and went before her, or a vague spiritual fear dash like to some doubtful noise of creaking doors, heard by the watcher in a haunted house, that keeps the rust of murder on the walls dash held her awake, or if she slept, she dreamed an awful dream. For then she seemed to stand on some vast plain before a setting sun, and from the sun there swiftly made at her a ghastly something, and its shadow flew before it, till it touched her, and she turned dash when lo! Her own, that broadening from her feet, and blackening, swallowed all the land, and in it far cities burned, and with a cry she woke. And all this trouble did not pass but grew till even the clear face of the guileless king, and trustful courtesies of household life, became her bane. And at the last she said, O Lancelot, get thee hence to thine own land, for if thou tire we shall meet again, and if we meet again, some evil chance will make the smoldering scandal break and blaze before the people, and our lord the king. And Lancelot ever promised, but remained, and still they met and met. Again she said, O Lancelot, if thou love me get thee hence. And then they were agreed upon a night when the good king should not be there to meet and part for ever. Vivian, lurking, heard. She told Sir Modred. Passion pale they met and greeted. Hands and hands, and eye to eye, low on the border of her couch they sat stammering and staring. It was their last hour, a madness of farewells. And Modred brought his creatures to the basement of the tower for testimony and crying with full voice traitor, come out, ye are trapped at last, aroused Lancelot, who rushing outward lion like leapt on him, and hurled him headlong, and he fell stunned, and his creatures took and bare him off, and all was still, 
Then she, the end is come, and I am shamed forever. And he said, Mine be the shame. Mine was the sin, but rise, and fly to my strong castle overseas, there will I hide thee, till my life shall end, there hold thee with my life against the world. She answered, Lancelot, wilt thou hold me so? Nay, friend, for we have taken our farewells. Would God that thou couldst hide me from myself. Mine is the shame, for I was wife, and thou unwedded, yet rise now, and let us fly, for I will draw me into sanctuary, and bide my doom. So Lancelot got her horse, set her thereon, and mounted on his own, and then they rode to the divided way, there kissed, and parted weeping, for he passed, love loyal to the least wish of the queen, back to his land. But she to Elmesbury fled all night long by glimmering waste and wield, and heard the spirits of the waste and wield moan as she fled, or thought she heard them moan, and in herself she moaned too late, too late. Till in the cold wind that forey runs the morn, a blot in heaven, the raven, flying high, croaked, and she thought, single quote she spies a field of death. For now the heathen of the northern sea, lured by the crimes and frailties of the court, begin to slay the folk, and spoil the land. And when she came to Elmesbury she spake there to the nuns, and said, Mine enemies pursue me, but, O peaceful sisterhood, receive, and yield me sanctuary, nor ask her name to whom ye yield it, till her time to tell you, and her beauty, grace and power, wrought as a charm upon them, and they spared to ask it. So the stately queen abode for many a week, unknown, among the nuns, nor with them mixed, nor told her name, nor sought wrapped in her grief, for household or for shrift, but commoned only with the little maid, who pleased her with a babbling heedlessness which often lured her from herself. But now, this night, a rumor wildly blown about camp, that Sir Modred had usurped the realm, and leagued him with the heathen, while the king was waging war on Lancelot, then she thought, with what I hate the people and the king must hate me, and bowed down upon her hands silent, until the little maid, who broke no silence, break it, uttering, late. So late. What hour, I wonder, now? And when she drew no answer, by and by began to hum an air the nuns had taught her. Late, so late. Which when she heard, the queen looked up, and said, O maiden, if indeed ye list to sing, sing, and unbind my heart that I may weep. Whereat full willingly sang the little maid. Late, late, so late. And dark the night and chill. Late, late, so late. But we can enter still. Too late, too late. Ye cannot enter now. No light had we, for that we do repent. And learning this, the bridegroom will relent. Too late, too late. Ye cannot enter now. No light, so late. And dark and chill the night. Oh let us in, that we may find the light. Too late, too late, ye cannot enter now. Have we not heard the bridegroom is so sweet? Oh let us in, though late, to kiss his feet. No, no, too late. Ye cannot enter now. So sang the novice, while full passionately, her head upon her hands, remembering her thought when first she came, what the sad queen. Then said the little novice prattling to her, Oh pray you, noble lady, weep no more. But let my words, the words of one so small, who knowing nothing knows but to obey, and if I do not there is penance given dash comfort your sorrows, for they do not flow from evil done. Right sure am I of that, who see your tender grace and stateliness. But weigh your sorrows with our Lord the Kings, and weighing find them less. For gone is he to wage grim war against Sir Lancelot there, round that strong castle where he holds the Queen. And Maudit whom he left in charge of all, the traitor a sweet lady, the king's grief for his own self, and his own queen, and realm, must needs be thrice as great as any of ours. For me, I thank the saints, I am not great. For if there ever come a grief to me I cry my cry in silence, and have done. None knows it, and my tears have brought me good, but even were the griefs of little ones as great as those of great ones, yet this grief is added to the griefs the great must bear, that howsoever much they may desire silence, they cannot weep behind a cloud, as even here they talk at Elmesbury about the good king and his wicked queen, and were I such a king with such a queen, well might I wish to veil her wickedness, but
but were I such a king, it could not be. Then to her own sad heart muttered the queen, Will the child kill me with her innocent talk? But openly she answered, Must not I, if this false traitor have displaced his lord, grieve with the common grief of all the realm? Yeah, said the maid, this is all woman's grief, that she is woman, whose disloyal life hath wrought confusion in the table round which good King Arthur founded, years ago, with signs and miracles and wonders, there at Camelot, at the coming of the queen. Then thought the queen within herself again, will the child kill me with her foolish prate? But openly she spake and said to her, O little maid, shut in by nunnery walls, what hadst thou know of kings and tables round, or what of signs and wonders, but the signs and simple miracles of thy nunnery? To whom the little novice garrulously, yea, but I know, the land was full of signs and wonders ere the coming of the queen. So said my father, and himself was knight of the great table at the founding of it, and rode thereto from Lyonis, and he said that as he rode, an hour or maybe twain after the sunset, down the coast, he heard strange music, and he paused, and turning there, all down the lonely coast of Lyonis, each with a beacon star upon his head, and with the wild sea light about his feet, he saw them headland after headland flame far on into the rich heart of the west, and in the light the white mermaiden swim, and strong man-breasted things stood from the sea, and sent a deep sea voice through all the land, to which the little elves of chasm and cleft made answer, sounding like a distant horn. So said my father yea, and furthermore, next morning, while he passed the dim-lit woods, himself beheld three spirits mad with joy come dashing down on a tall wayside flower, that shook beneath them, as the thistle shakes when three grail in its wrangle for the seed, and still at evenings on before his horse the flickering fairy circle wheeled and broke flying, and linked again, and wheeled and broke flying, for all the land was full of life. And when at last he came to Camelot, a wreath of airy dancers hand in hand swung round the lighted lantern of the hall. And in the hall itself was such a feast as never man had dreamed. For every night had whatsoever meat he longed for served by hands unseen. And even as he sat down in the cellar's merry bloated things shouldered the spigot, straddling on the butts while the wine ran, so glad were spirits and men before the coming of the sinful queen. Then spake the queen and somewhat bitterly, Were they so glad? Ill prophets were they all, spirits and men, could none of them foresee, not even thy wise father with his signs and wonders, what has fallen upon the realm? To whom the novice garrulously again, yea, one, a bard. Of whom my father said, full many a noble war song had he sung, even in the presence of an enemy's fleet, between the steep cliff and the coming wave. And many a mystic lay of life and death had chanted on the smoky mountain tops, when round him bent the spirits of the hills with all their dewy hair blown back like flame. So said my father in that night the bard sang Arthur's glorious wars, and sang the king is well near more than man, and railed at those who called him the false son of Gorlos, for there was no man knew from whence he came. But after tempest, when the long way broke all down the thundering showers of Bude and Boss, there came a day as still as heaven, and then they found a naked child upon the sands of dark Tintagel by the Cornish Sea. And that was Arthur and they fostered him till he by miracle was a proven king, and that his grave should be a mystery from all men, like his birth. And could he find a woman in her womanhood as great as he was in his manhood, then, he sang, the twain together well might change the world. But even in the middle of his song he faltered, and his hand fell from the harp, and pale he turned, and reeled, and would have fallen, but that they stayed him up. Nor would he tell his vision but with doubt that he foresaw this evil work of Lancelot and the Queen. Then thought the Queen, Lo! They have set her on, our simple seeming abyss and her nuns, to play upon me, and bowed her head nor spake. Whereat the novice crying, with clasped hands, shame on her own garrulity garrulously, said the good nuns would check her gadding tongue full often, and, sweet lady, if I seem to vex an ear too sad to listen to me, unmannerly with prattling in the tales which my good father told me, check me too nor let me shame my father's memory, one of noblest manners, though himself would say Sir Lancelot had the noblest. And he died, killed in a tilt, come next, five summers back, and left me. But of others who remain, and of the two first famed for courtesy dash, and pray you check me if I ask amiss but pray you, 
which had noblest, while you moved among them, Lancelot or our lord the king? Then the pale queen looked up and answered her, Sir Lancelot, as became a noble knight, was gracious to all ladies, and the same in open battle or the tilting field forbear his own advantage, and the king in open battle or the tilting field forbear his own advantage, and these two were the most nobly mannered men of all. For manners are not idle, but the fruit of loyal nature, and of noble mind. Yeah, said the maid, single quote be manners such fair fruit. Then Lancelot's needs must be a thousandfold less noble, being, as our rumor runs, the most disloyal friend in all the world. To which a mournful answer made the queen, O closed about by narrowing nunnery walls, what knowest thou of the world, and all its lights and shadows, all the wealth and all the woe? If ever Lancelot, that most noble knight, were for one hour less noble than himself, pray for him that he scaped the doom of fire, and weep for her that drew him to his doom. Yea, said the little novice, I pray for both. But I should all as soon believe that his, Sir Lancelot's, were as noble as the king's, as I could think, sweet lady, yours would be such as they are, were you the sinful queen. So she, like many another babbler, hurt whom she would soothe, and harmed where she would heal. For here a sudden flesh of wrathful heat fired all the pale face of the queen, who cried, Such as thou art be never maiden more for ever. Thou their tool, said on the plague and play upon, and harry me, petty spy and traitress. When that storm of anger break from Guinevere, aghast the maiden rose, white as her veil, and stood before the queen as tremulously as foam upon the beach stands in a wind, ready to break and fly, and when the queen had added get thee hence fled frighted. Then that other left alone sighed, and began to gather heart again, saying in herself, The simple, fearful child meant nothing, but my own too fearful guilt, simpler than any child, betrays itself. But help me, heaven, for surely I repent. For what is true repentance, but in thought dash not even an inmost thought to think again the sins that made the past so pleasant to us, and I have sworn never to see him more to see him more. And even in saying this, her memory from old habit of the mind went slipping back upon the golden days in which she saw him first, when Lancelot came, reputed the best knight and goodliest man, ambassador, to lead her to his lord Arthur, and led her forth, and far ahead of his and her retinue moving, they, wrapped in sweet talk or lively, all on love and sport and tilts and pleasure, for the time was Maytime, and as yet no sin was dreamed rode under groves that looked a paradise of blossom, over sheets of hyacinth that seemed the heavens upbreaking through the earth, and on from hill to hill, and every day beheld at noon in some delicious dale the silk pavilions of King Arthur raised for brief repast or afternoon repose by couriers gone before. And on again, till yet once more or set of sun they saw the dragon of the great Prundragon ship, that crowned the state pavilion of the king, blaze by the rushing brook or silent well. But when the queen immersed in such a trance, and moving through the past unconsciously, came to that point where first she saw the king ride toward her from the city, sighed to find her journey done, glanced at him, thought him cold, high, self-contained, and passionless, not like him, not like my Lancelot Dash while she brooded thus and grew half guilty in her thoughts again, there rode an armed warrior to the doors. A murmuring whisper through the nunnery ran, then on a sudden a cry, the king. She sat stiff stricken, listening. But when armed feet through the long gallery from the outer doors rang coming, prone from off her seat she fell, and groveled with her face against the floor, there with her milk-white arms and shadowy hair she made her face a darkness from the king, and in the darkness heard his armed feet pause by her. Then came silence, then a voice, monotonous and hollow like a ghost denouncing judgment, but though changed, the king's, Leas thou here so low, the child of one I honored, happy, dead before thy shame? Well is it that no child is born of thee. The children born of the air sword and fire, red ruin, and the breaking up of laws, the craft of kindred and the godless hosts of heathen swarming o'er the northern sea. Whom I, while yet Sir Lancelot, my right arm, the mightiest of my knights, abode with me, have everywhere about this land of Christ and twelve great battles ruining overthrown. And knowest thou now from whence I come from him from waging bitter war with him, and he, 
that did not shun to smite me in worse way, had yet that grace of courtesy in him left, he spared to lift his hand against the king who made him knight, but many a knight was slain, and many more, and all his kith and kin clave to him, and abode in his own land, and many more when moderate raised revolt, forgetful of their troth and fealty, clave to moderate, and a remnant stays with me, and of this remnant will I leave a part, true men who love me still, for whom I live, to guard thee in the wild hour coming on, lest but a hair of this low head be harmed. Fear not, thou shalt be guarded till my death. Habeed I know, if ancient prophecies have erred not, that I march to meet my doom. Thou hast not made my life so sweet to me, that I the king should greatly care to live. For thou hast spoiled the purpose of my life. Bear with me for the last time while I show, even for thy sake, the sin which thou hast sinned. For when the Roman left us, and their glory laxed its hold upon us, and the ways were filled with rapine, here and there a deed of prowess done redressed a random wrong. But I was first of all the kings who drew the knighthood errant of this realm, and all the realms together under me, their head, in that fair order of my table round, a glorious company, the flower of men, to serve as model for the mighty world, and be the fair beginning of a time. I made them lay their hands on mine and swear to reverence the king, as if he were their conscience, and their conscience as their king, to break the heathen and uphold the Christ, to ride abroad redressing human wrongs, to speak no slander, no, nor listen to it, to honor his own word as if his gods, to lead sweet lives in purest chastity, to love one maiden only, cleave to her, and worship her by years of noble deeds, until they won her for indeed I knew of no more subtle master under heaven than is the maiden passion for a maid, not only to keep down a base and man, but teach high thought, and amiable words and courtliness, and the desire of fame, and love of truth, and all that makes a man. And all this throve before I wedded thee, believing, and person quo. Lo mine helpmate, want to feel my purpose and rejoicing in my joy. And person quo. Then came thy shameful sin with Lancelot. Then came the sin of Tristram and Isolt. Then others, following these my mightiest knights, and drawing foul and sample from fair names, sinned also, till the loathsome opposite of all my heart had destined did obtain, and all through thee. So that this life of mine I guard as God's high gift from scathe and wrong, not greatly care to lose. But rather think how sad it were for Arthur, should he live, to sit once more within his lonely hall, and miss the wonted number of my knights and miss to hear high talk of noble deeds as in the golden days before thy sin. For which of us, who might be left, could speak of the pure heart, nor seem to glance at thee? And in thy bowers of Camelot or of Usk thy shadow still would glide from room to room, and I should evermore be vexed with thee in hanging robe or vacant ornament, or ghostly footfall echoing on the stair. For think not, though thou wouldst not love thy lord, thy lord hast wholly lost his love for thee. I am not made of so slight elements. Yet must I leave thee, woman, to thy shame. I hold that man the worst of public foes who either for his own or children's sake, to save his blood from scandal, lets the wife whom he knows false, abide and rule the house, for being through his cowardice allowed her station, taken everywhere for pure, she like a new disease, unknown to men, creeps, no precaution used, among the crowd, makes wicked lightnings of her eyes, and saps the fealty of our friends, and stirs the pulse with devil's leaps, and poisons half the young. Worst of the worst were that man he that reigns. Better the king's waste hearth and aching heart than thou receded in thy place of light, the mockery of my people, and their bane. He paused, and in the pause she crept an inch nearer, and laid her hands about his feet. Far off a solitary trumpet blew. Then waiting by the doors the war horse night out a friend's voice. And he spake again, Yet think not that I come to urge thy crimes, I did not come to curse thee, Guinevere, I, whose vast pity almost makes me die to see thee, laying there thy golden head, my pride and happier summers, at my feet. The wrath which forced my thoughts on that fierce law, the doom of treason and the flaming death, when first I learned thee hidden here, is past. The pang which while I weighed thy heart with one too holy true to dream untruth in thee, made my tears burn is also past in part. And all is past, the sin is sinned, and I, lo, I forgive thee, as eternal God forgives, 
do thou for thine own soul the rest. But how to take last leave of all I loved? O golden hair, with which I used to play not knowing. O imperial molded form, and beauty such as never woman wore, until it became a kingdom's curse with thee dash I cannot touch thy lips, they are not mine, but Lancelot's, nay, they never were the king's. I cannot take thy hand, that too is flesh, and in the flesh thou hast sinned. And mine own flesh, here looking down on thine polluted, cries Amperson Quo. I loathe thee, Amperson Quo. Yet not less, O Guinevere, for I was ever virgin save for thee, my love through flesh hath wrought into my life so far, that my doom is, I love thee still. Let no man dream but that I love thee still. Perchance, and so thou purify thy soul, and so thou lean on our fair father Christ, hereafter in that world where all are pure we too may meet before high God, and thou wilt spring to me, and claim me thine, and know I am thine husband not a smaller soul, nor Lancelot, nor another. Leave me that, I charge thee, my last hope. Now must I hence. Through the thick night I hear the trumpet blow, they summon me their king to lead mine hosts far down to that great battle in the west, where I must strike against the man they call my sister's son no kin of mine, who leagues with lords of the white horse, heathen, and knights, traitors and strike him dead, and meet myself death, or I know not what mysterious doom. And thou remaining here wilt learn the event. But hither shall I never come again, never lie by thy side. See thee no more dash farewell. And while she groveled at his feet, she felt the king's breath wander o'er her neck and in the darkness o'er her fallen head, perceived the waving of his hands that blessed. Then, listening till those armed steps were gone, rose the pale queen, and in her anguish found the casement, peradventure, so she thought, if I might see his face, and not be seen. And lo, he sat on horseback at the door. And near him the sad nuns with each a light stood, and he gave them charge about the queen, to guard and foster her forevermore. And while he spake to these his helm was lowered, to which for a crest the golden dragon clung of Britain. So she did not see the face, which then was as an angel's, but she saw, what with the missin smitten by the lights, the dragon of the great Pern ship blaze, making all the night a steam of fire. And even then he turned, and more and more the moon of a poor rolling round the king, who seemed the phantom of a giant in it, and wound him fold by fold, and made him grey and grey till himself became as mist before her, moving ghost-like to his doom. Then she stretched out her arms and cried aloud, O Arthur! There her voice breaks suddenly, then as a stream that spouting from a cliff fails in mid-air, but gathering at the base remakes itself, and flashes down the veil dash when on in passionate utterance, Gin my lord! Gone through my sin to slay and to be slain! And he forgave me, and I could not speak. Farewell? I should have answered his farewell. His mercy choked me. Gone, my lord the king, my own true lord. How dare I call him mine? The shadow of another cleaves to me, and makes me one pollution. He, the king, called me polluted. Shall I kill myself? What help in that? I cannot kill my sin, if soul be soul. Nor can I kill my shame. No, nor by living can I live it down. The days will grow to weeks the weeks to months the months will add themselves and make the years, the years will roll into the centuries, and mine will ever be a name of scorn. I must not dwell on that defeat of fame. Let the world be. That is but of the world. What else? What hope? I think there was a hope, except he mocked me when he spake of hope. His hope he called it. But he never mocks, for mockery is the fume of little hearts. And blessed be the king who hath forgiven my wickedness to him, and left me hope that in mine own heart I can live down sin and be his maid hereafter in the heavens before high God. Our great and gentle Lord, who waste, as is the conscience of a saint among his warring senses, to thy night's dash to my false voluptuous pride, that took full easily all impressions from below, would not look up, or half despised the height to which I would not or I could not climb dash I thought I could not breathe in that fine air that pure severity of perfect light dash I yearned for warmth and color which I found in Lancelot now I see thee what thou art, thou art the highest and most human too, not Lancelot, nor another. Is there none will tell the king I love him though so late? 
narrowly goes to the great battle. None, myself must tell him in that pure life, but now it were too daring. Oh my God, what might I not have made of thy fair world, had I but loved thy highest creature here? It was my duty to have loved the highest, it surely was my profit had I known, it would have been my pleasure had I seen. We needs must love the highest when we see it, not Lancelot, nor another. Here her hand grasped, made her veil her eyes, she looked and saw the novice, weeping, suppliant, and said to her, Yea, little maid, for am I not forgiven? Then glancing up beheld the holy nuns all round her, weeping. And her heart was loosed within her, and she wept with these and said, Single quote why know me then, that wicked one, who broke the vast design and purpose of the king. Oh shut me round with narrowing nunnery walls, meek maidens, from the voices crying in quo. Shame. Am person quo. I must not scorn myself, he loves me still. Let no one dream but that he loves me still. So let me, if you do not shudder at me, nor shun to call me sister, dwell with you. Wear black and white, and be a nun like you, fast with your fasts, not feasting with your feasts. Grieve with your griefs, not grieving at your joys, but not rejoicing. Mingle with your rites. Pray and be prayed for. Lie before your shrines. Do each low office of your holy house. Walk your dim cloister, and distribute all the poor sick people richer in his eyes who ransomed us, and holler too than I, and treat their loathsome hurts and heal mine own. And so wear out an alms deed and prayer the somber close of that voluptuous day, which wrought the ruin of my lord the king. She said, they took her to themselves. And she still hoping, fearing is it yet too late? Dwelt with them, till in time their best died. Then she, for her good deeds and her pure life, and for the power of ministration in her, and likewise for the high rank she had borne, was chosen a best, there, and a best, lived for three brief years, and there, and a best, passed to where beyond these voices there is peace.